Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing circadian clocks. Okay, right. So we're currently in the process of discussing the mammalian circadian clock. Okay, now we have seen the main example of a mammalian circadian clock, which is present in most mammalian cells within the body of a mammal. Okay, and we've seen that this is a transcriptional translational feedback loop that has a, a period of 24 hours basically. Okay, we've also seen that it has this accessory loop on the side which helps to uh, reinforce the main transcriptional translational feedback loop. Okay, right. So now what we want to turn our attention onto is the question of how are uh, these circadian clocks in many peripheral cells within a mammal's body actually kept in synchrony with each other, okay? And how do you keep them in synchrony with the light-dark cycle? Okay, right. Uh, so basically, when the um, circadian clock is running at the, in, in synchrony with the light-dark cycles, then this should be how it works. Period in cryptochrome should be going up uh, from midnight to midday. It should reach a peak at midday and then drop back down to the lower level uh, by the next midnight, basically. Okay, that is how uh, the circadian clock should be functioning if it's in synchrony with the light-dark cycles. Okay, now in the human body, you're going to have cells all over the place that are using this uh, circadian clock system and they will all be working like this. They'll all be perfectly in synchrony with period and cryptochrome going up at midday and then going to a bottom at midnight, basically. Okay, so they'll all be in synchrony with each other and therefore all in synchrony with the light-dark cycles. And these cells will be responding appropriately uh, at appropriate times of the day to the light-dark cycle, to the real time, effectively. Okay, but why? Why is it like that? Okay, because nothing about this transcriptional translational feedback loop that I have told you about says that it has to work like that. Why can't this be shifted to either side, basically? What is stopping cells from uh, shifting it from side to side? What keeps it in synchrony with the light-dark cycle, basically? Okay, right. Uh, so, um, now, um, the answer is not the same as the answer in Drosophila. We saw that in Drosophila melanogaster cells, the answer was that every single cell had the ability to respond to light and to resynchronize its own circadian clock uh, with the light-dark cycle, basically. That's not the way it works in mammals, okay? If you take a plate of cultured human fibroblasts, okay, and uh, expose them to a normal light-dark cycle, then their circadian clocks will not synchronize with that light-dark cycle, and in fact, all of the fibroblasts on the plate will be at a different circadian time, basically. Their circadian cycles will all be out of sync with each other, okay? Uh, so their graphs will not all be peaking at midday and uh, troughing at midnight. That's, some of them might be peaking at 9 a.m. in the morning and uh, troughing at, at 9 o'clock at night, okay? So um, something in the uh, mammalian body then is keeping all of the peripheral cells, circadian clocks, uh, in time with one another, okay, and also in time with the light-dark cycle, and it's that uh, that we now want to study, okay, what is it in the mammal that keeps all of the peripheral cells, circadian clocks, in time with one another, and in time with the light-dark cycle. Okay, right. Uh, so this is a structure, or rather structures, called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, the plural is the suprachiasmatic nuclei, the singular is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Okay, so we now want to study the suprachiasmatic nuclei. There are two suprachiasmatic nuclei in the brain, okay? Uh, and for short, we'll abbreviate the suprachiasmatic nuclei down to the SCN, okay? But usually when people write SCN, uh, they mean suprachiasmatic nucleus, the singular, rather than the plural. Okay, right. So these structures, whatever they are, are responsible for keeping um, all of the other cells of the body 
in time with one another. So keeping all of their circadian clocks in time with one another. Okay, and also they are responsible for making sure that uh, all of the uh, cells of the body are in synchrony with the light-dark cycle. So there's two jobs here. This has to firstly make sure that all of the cells are in synchrony with each other, and then secondly, we don't want them to all be in synchrony, but they're not in synchrony with the light-dark cycles. So the suprachiasmatic nuclei also have the role of actually making sure that all of the cells are in synchrony with the light-dark cycle. Okay, right. So, um, the suprachiasmatic nuclei then are often described as the master clocks, basically. Okay, uh, they are the clock which keeps all the other clocks in synchrony, basically. It determines what time all of the peripheral clocks are running at, basically. Okay, right. So, before we actually go over what uh, the suprachiasmatic nuclei actually do, how they maintain uh, synchrony with the light-dark cycles, and then how they communicate to all the other cells of the body and tell them at uh, what time their clock should be running at, okay? What I want to firstly discuss is the anatomy of the suprachiasmatic nuclei in the human, okay? So that we actually know what we're talking about here. Okay, so that's the prerequisite stuff that I want to go over. So, I'm going to start off by drawing a very basic picture of the brain so that I can show you where the hypothalamus is and then uh, show you where the suprachiasmatic nuclei within the hypothalamus are. Okay, because I'm not assuming that you uh, know neuroanatomy coming into this. So I'm going to start from a picture that I think everyone will be familiar with, and then we'll gradually develop up to find first the hypothalamus, and then we'll find the suprachiasmatic nuclei in the hypothalamus. Okay, right. So the first picture then that I'm going to draw is a side view of the brain. Okay, so we're looking at the brain, at someone's brain, from the left-hand side here. Okay, so this is the left cerebral hemisphere here. And then poking out from the, underneath the cerebral hemispheres, what you'll then have is the brain stem, like so, with the spinal cord below it. Okay, and then you'll also have the cerebellum here. Okay, so let me just colour in some structures here. Okay, so this in green, this is the spinal cord, okay? Uh, so this is not in the school, basically. This has, is the continuation of the brainstem down into the vertebral column. Okay, so if I just mark on here the uh, exit from the school, the hole at the base of the school through which the spinal cord passes upwards to get uh, into the brain and become the brainstem is called the foramen magnum. And I've just marked that now on my picture there. Okay, so um, the spinal cord is not in the skull then. It has, it's the portion of the brainstem that's after the foramen magnum, okay? Or you can view the brainstem as the portion of the spinal cord that's above the foramen magnum, whatever you like. So the foramen magnum is a large uh, hole at the base of the skull through which the spinal cord passes to become the brainstem. Okay, and it's shown here as that ring that's now coloured in orange. Okay, right. Uh, now let's talk about the brainstem structures that we can see there. So once the spinal cord has passed through the frame and magnum, the continuation of the spinal cord is then called the brainstem. And we can see two different portions of it here. So that portion that I've just coloured in in purple, and that's called the medulla. Okay. So we're seeing the medulla from the left-hand side. There's only one medulla. It sits in the centre, basically. Again, it's just like a continuation of the spinal cord. Okay? And then above the medulla, we can only see the bottom aspect of it. Okay, the rest of it's sort of hidden underneath uh, the cerebral hemispheres now. There is a structure called the pons there, which is also part of the brain stem. Okay? So I've cut the pons in in blue. To put... Uh, other structures on here. Let's colour in the cerebellum here in turquoise. Okay, so the cerebellum is the portion uh, sitting behind the brainstem, and it literally means a little brain. Okay, it's extremely important in the motor system. Okay, so there's the cerebellum. And then, obviously, the main bit that we've got up here in yellow, these are the cerebral hemispheres, or rather, this is the left cerebral hemisphere that we're actually seeing here. 
Okay, so this is the cerebrum. Okay, specifically we're seeing the left cerebrum and we will be seeing the left half of the cerebellum as well. Okay, right. So that's the first picture that we're going to start off with. Okay, now, we can't see the hypothalamus as of yet, okay, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take away the cerebral hemispheres, okay, so imagine getting rid of the cerebral hemispheres, and what I want to do is look at the continuation of the brainstem upwards, because the brainstem continues on and sits in the middle of the cerebral hemispheres, in the middle of the left cerebral hemisphere and the right cerebral hemisphere. So I want to take away the cerebral hemispheres, basically, and see this continuation of the brainstem upwards so that we can find uh, the hypothalamus. Okay, right, uh, so that's what I'm going to do in the next picture. I'm going to get rid of the cerebral hemispheres. I'm also going to stop showing the cerebellum, so we're going to get rid of the cerebellum as well. And we're going to show the continuation of the brainstem upwards. Okay, right, so once again, here is the spinal cord here. Then above the spinal cord, you've then got the medulla here. Okay, the pons. There, so I'll just colour in those two bits. Uh, so we'll have the medulla once again in purple here. Okay, we'll have the spinal cord once again in green here. Okay, and then we'll have the pons in blue. And now we're going to see the final portion of the brain stem. So the brain stem consists of three separate structures. The medulla and the pons we've seen, but then there's one final structure that sits on top of the pons here, which is called the midbrain. Okay, and that wasn't visible in our previous picture. That would have been uh, deep within the cerebral hemispheres. Okay, so we can only see it now that we've removed the uh, left and right cerebral hemispheres here. Okay, and again, there's only one midbrain. It's sitting right in the center. Okay, so you've got the left half and the right half of the midbrain, but there's only one midbrain. Okay, right. So those are the three brainstem structures. We've finished the brainstem now. Okay, the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. Together they make up what's called the brainstem. Okay, we now want to see the things that sit above the brainstem, basically. The continuation up here, basically, because that's where we're going to find the thalami and then the hypothalamus. Okay, right. So next up, what I want to show before we put on the hypothalamus is the thalami. Okay, now there are not, sorry, there is not just one thalamus. This is something that people often get confused about. Okay, there are two thalami. Okay, uh, there's one sitting on top of the left half of the midbrain and there's one sitting on top of the right half of the midbrain. We are looking from the left hand side here, so we are seeing the left thalamus here perched on top of the left half of the midbrain. Okay, and each one of the thalami, the left thalamus and the right thalamus, both of them are egg-shaped structures. Okay, so you've got a left thalamus sitting on top of the left half of the midbrain, and a right thalamus sitting on top of the right half of the midbrain, which we can't see on this picture here. Okay, it would be behind the left thalamus in our picture. Okay, but we will draw a picture next, uh, where we'll be looking from above, in which we will be able to see the uh, left and right thalamus, uh, thalami rather, separately. Okay, right. Let's now put onto this picture the hypothalamus then. Now, the hypothalamus sits in front of the two thalami, okay, and it will be looking like this from the left hand side, which we're looking from, okay. Here is the pituitary gland dangling down like so, and here is the mammillary body. Okay, right, so let me just colour in the different portions here. Okay, right, so this portion firstly right down here, and remember we are looking from the left hand side. Bits will become clearer when we look from other angles in a moment, okay? But from the left hand side, what we are seeing there in yellow, that is the optic chiasm. Okay, uh, and that's running uh, in the plane, uh, sorry, running in the axis into the page, basically. So we're just seeing a cross section of it, basically, because it's really running in this sort of direction here. Okay, we will later take a cross section through the hypothalamus and we'll see this in um, full length, basically. 
Okay, now remember the optic chiasm is the place where uh, fibres uh, from the two separate retinae can cross uh, to join the opposite optic tracks, basically. Okay, right. Um, now, then we've got the pituitary gland, which is an endocrine gland uh, which dangles down from the hypothalamus here and is receiving a orders basically from the hypothalamus with regards to what it should be secreting. Okay, so in orange here, this is the pituitary gland. Okay, and I'll underline that in orange. Right, then those little structures that we can see here, and we can only see one of them, the left one. Okay, but there is another one on the right side as well. Those are called the mammillary bodies, and they're part of the hypothalamus. Okay, they're important in memory, but they're not going to be uh, particularly important for us to talk about. Okay, so now in blue, all of that then is the hypothalamus. Okay, now uh, it's a more complicated structure than it appears from uh, looking at it uh, in the view that we have seen it here. Okay, in actual fact, the hypothalamus is very much so split into a left and right half by the third ventricle, which is a big cavity running down the middle of it. Okay, and to get this better perspective, what we need to really do is draw another picture where instead of looking from the left-hand side, we're going to look from above here. Okay, and this will also help us to understand the fact that there is a left thalamus and a right thalamus. Okay, so when we view from above rather than from the left-hand side, we will find out that the hypothalamus is not just one solid lump sitting in front of the uh, midbrain and the thalami here. In fact, it's got a hollow cavity inside it. Okay, and this splits it into a left and right-hand side. Okay, and this is important to understand. So, let's turn over the page now and look at what we've just been looking at, but now from above. Okay, so I'm going to start off by showing you the two thalami, okay, viewed now from above, okay, so this is the left thalamus here, so this is the front, this is the back, this is the left hand side, this is the right hand side, okay, and here then, this is the uh, right thalamus here. Okay, and they'll be sitting on top of the midbrain underneath, okay, uh, and this is the central axis here, so this is the center of the brain, the middle of the brain, okay, the left cerebral hemisphere will be on top here, and the right cerebral hemisphere will be on top here. Okay, right, now the hypothalamus is not just one solid lump sitting here, instead, the hypothalamus it has a gap running through the middle of it, just like the two thalami have a gap running through the middle of them. Okay, so let me now show this. So this is what the hypothalamus actually looks like, like this, coming forward from the thalami, okay, like so, with this gap in between them, okay, here, and then it will continue on down that way. Okay, so this is what I mean by saying that the hypothalamus is very much so uh, split into a left-hand side and a right-hand side. This is the left-hand side of the hypothalamus, and this is the right-hand side of the hypothalamus. Okay, so let's put some colour on here. So here are the thalami, that's the left thalamus, this is the right thalamus, and we'll have both of those in turquoise. Then we have the hypothalamus thalamus in front, so the left side of the hypothalamus and the right side of the hypothalamus, okay. Now, this great big cavity in the middle, okay, which is bounded at the back by a structure that I want to put on here called the pineal gland, which we will be talking about later on. This is the gland which releases uh, melatonin, okay, which is a, a molecule closely related to serotonin. Okay, and it will be important later on. This is one of the things we think is extremely important in synchronizing all of the peripheral cells, uh, circadian clocks, uh, with the circadian clock of the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, we think rhythmic secretion of melatonin by the pineal gland is extremely important potentially in communicating to peripheral cells, but we'll come back to that later on. 
Okay, right. Now let's study the hypothalamus in more detail. So we've seen that the hypothalamus has this left-hand side and this right-hand side. Okay, now, uh, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the hypothalamus, then, are split into three layers. Okay, oh, whoops, and I've missed something out here. We need to set, talk about uh, what this cavity in the middle is before we go any further. Okay, so this cavity uh, marked by the hypothalamus in the front here, okay, marked by the two thalami towards the back here, and then marked at the back by the pineal gland, this is called the third ventricle. So what we are looking at here is the third ventricle, and this is a large cavity in the middle of the brain that is full of cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so I'll just colour in this cavity in red. So this is the third ventricle full of cerebrospinal fluid, basically. Okay, and this is what is splitting uh, the left hypothalamus and the right hypothalamus apart. Okay, or rather the left side of the hypothalamus and the right side of the hypothalamus. I should say that People don't talk about there being two hypothalami, there's only one hypothalamus, but we do talk about the left side of the hypothalamus and the right side of the hypothalamus. Okay, and some people end up just abbreviating left side of the hypothalamus down to left hypothalamus and right side of the hypothalamus down to right hypothalamus. But no one would ever talk about hypothalami, okay, but there's only one hypothalamus. Okay, right. Um, so, um, we were now discussing about how uh, the two halves of the hypothalamus are going to be split into three layers, basically. Okay, and I want to show this now. Okay, so there is the layer of the hypothalamus on both sides that is closest to the third ventricle here. Okay, and I'm going to colour in this layer in orange here. And this is what's known as the periventricular portion of the left and right sides of the hypothalamus. Okay, so this is called periventricular hypothalamus. Okay, right. Uh, then, uh, the remaining portion of the two sides of the hypothalamus, um, that is split into two more portions. Okay, so I'll do this now. So, these are going to be split further into two more portions. Okay, there is a medial portion, so both the left side of the hypothalamus and the right side of the hypothalamus have medial portions, which are the portions closer to the periventricular portion. Okay, and then they have lateral portions, which are the portions further away. Okay, so let me now just colour these in. So we'll start by colouring in the medial portions of each side of the hypothalamus uh, in, in green. So here's the left uh, medial uh, hypothalamus, and this is the right medial hypothalamus. Okay, and then finally, we'll have the lateral uh, portion of the right and left sides of the hypothalamus in, in purple here. Okay, so this is the lateral portion of the left side of the hypothalamus, and this is the lateral portion of the right side of the hypothalamus. And they're now in purple. Okay, right. So that is how both the left and right sides of the hypothalamus are uh, divided up into these three layers. The periventricular layer, which is closest to the third ventricle, then the medial layer, uh, and then finally the lateral layer, which is furthest away from the uh, third ventricle. Okay, right. So, we now want to try and find the suprachiasmatic nuclei, okay? Uh, and there are two suprachiasmatic nuclei. One is on the left side of the hypothalamus, and the other is on the right side of the hypothalamus. So there's a left suprachiasmatic nucleus and a right suprachiasmatic nucleus. Okay, right. So, uh, I want to now take two cross-sections of the hypothalamus and show you uh, the structures in them, okay? Uh, now, basically, uh, we're not just going to look for the suprachiasmatic nuclei, okay? Because in my discussions later on, we're going to need a lot of other hypothalamic nuclei, such as the paraventricular nuclei, the anterior hypothalamic nuclei, okay? All of these are important as well, so I want to um, find those as well right now whilst we're doing the anatomy, okay, so that later on when we come on to use them, we know where they are already. 
Okay, right, so if you like, this is the prerequisite anatomy for what we're about to discuss. Okay, so I want to take two cross sections then through the hypothalamus. The first is going to be right at the front here, so I'll call that number one here. And then the second is going to be further back here. Okay, and we'll call that number two. Okay, so what I'm going to do is put my carving knife down there. We're currently looking from above. I'm going to cut through at both of those, and then we're going to look uh, at the opened up surface, basically. Okay, we're going to look at the cross section of the hypothalamus. Right, so we firstly looked at this. Let's firstly look at cross section number one here. Now, going back to this picture for a moment, cross section number one is effectively down there, basically. So we're now going to see the optic chiasm uh, in its full length, basically. Okay. So let me now show you uh, cross section number one. Okay. So underneath then the hypothalamus, we're going to have the optic chiasm. Okay. So this is cross section number one. So here is the optic chiasm. Okay. Then we'll have a portion of the hypothalamus which we've actually cut through here. Okay, and then actually above it, I'd like to show you an important structure that runs above it at this sort of portion. Okay, so this will be running above the hypothalamus uh, again uh, in this direction, in parallel with the direction that the optic chiasm is in, basically. Okay, uh, and this is called the anterior commissure. So let me just mark these two on. So this is my cross section here. This is the section of hypothalamus which I'm going to put in the details of in a moment. Okay, but bounded above and below uh, by these two white matter bundles, basically. Below here is the optic chiasm. Okay, so this point where um, neurons in the right and left optic nerves are crossing over, basically. Okay, so here's the optic chiasm. And then above here, above this section of hypothalamus, we again have another white matter bundle, okay? And this is what's called the anterior commissure, okay? So basically, a commissure is just a fancy knit word for a, a bundle of axons, a white matter bundle, okay, that moves from left to right, and this is moving from left to right, or, sorry, it doesn't have to be from left to right, it could be from right to left, of course, but it's moving from one side of the body to the other, basically, in the this sort of axis, basically, okay, so that's the anterior commissure here. So above the hypothalamus, uh, at this very much so anterior cross-section that we've taken, you have the anterior commissure. Underneath, you have the optic chiasm. The anterior commissure is a white matter bundle that connects the two temporal lobes. Okay, so it's a way that the two temporal lobes can communicate with one another. Okay, right. So now let's turn to the actual portion of the hypothalamus that we've cut through here. Okay. So let's firstly mark on the third ventricle here. So the third ventricle will be extremely thin here, okay, like so. And then around it, what we'll have is the periventricular portion of the hypothalamus. Okay, so let's color this in. So here is the third ventricle here in red, okay. Then we've got the periventricular hypothalamus in green here. Okay, and then we'll have medial and lateral portions uh, of both sides here, so I'll divide those up. So this is medial portions of both sides of the hypothalamus, and remember, we're now looking from above, sorry, from in front, I'm imagining. Okay, I should have said that. Uh, so this is the left-hand side, and this is the right-hand side. It doesn't really make that much difference, because what I've drawn is utterly symmetrical, and in fact, it's going to remain utterly symmetrical. But let's say we are looking from in the front, basically. So we're looking from this direction here. This is the top, this is the bottom, so this must be the left-hand side, and this must be the right-hand side. Okay, right. Uh, so, now what I want to do is show you the different nuclei that are in the medial portions and the lateral portions when you take this very anterior cross-section of the hypothalamus. Okay, so, there are four different nuclei, and I'm going to divide it up like so. Okay, so, at the superior portions, what we have is uh, 
two different types of nuclei, which are known as the preoptic nuclei. So let me colour all of these in. So we'll start with this one here, okay, which I'm colouring in in vivid purple. And you'll have this on both sides. So here's another one here. Okay, these are called the medial preoptic nucleus, or, or rather medial preoptic nuclei. Okay, we're not going to use these, but I just want you to have a complete picture of uh, where everything is in this picture. Okay, so this is the medial preoptic nucleus, okay, or rather medial preoptic nuclei. So this is the left medial preoptic nucleus, this is the right medial preoptic nucleus. And for short, you would abbreviate this down to M for medial, and then PO for preoptic, and then nucleus. Okay, so I will underline medial preoptic nucleus in the purple since it's been coloured in in the purple over there. Okay, next up I will put uh, this one here that sits alongside the medial preoptic nucleus in the superior portion of this uh, very anterior cross section of the hypothalamus. Okay. So these two nuclei are the lateral preoptic nuclei, and for short, these will be abbreviated to the LPON, okay, for lateral preoptic nuclei. So again, you have two of them. You have the left lateral preoptic nucleus and the right lateral preoptic nucleus. Okay, then below where we have these medial and lateral preoptic nuclei, what you're going to have is the suprachiasmatic nuclei here. Okay, so these are the ones we really wanted to know. So these are very important uh, for our discussion. Okay, so then take note, basically. Okay, so these are now the suprachiasmatic nuclei. So we've got the left suprachiasmatic nucleus here and the uh, right suprachiasmatic nucleus here. And you can see that they're sitting underneath the left and right medial preoptic nuclei, uh, respectively. Okay, right. Uh, then just to finish the picture off, um, let's put what's in here in this fourth position. This, these are what are known as the supraoptic nuclei. Okay, and for short, I'll abbreviate supraoptic nuclei down to SON. Okay, but I suppose I probably should write it out in full. So this is supra, whoops, supra, and then optic. That's the O, and then nucleus. And again, you have a left supraoptic nucleus and a right supraoptic nucleus here. Okay, right, so now we know where the suprachiasmatic nuclei are. We know why they're called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Uh, they sit above the optic chiasm, basically, okay? Perfectly above it uh, and below the medial preoptic nuclei and uh, lateral to this periventricular portion of the hypothalamus there in orange. Okay, so they're at this very anterior portion of the hypothalamus, located just above the supra, sorry, um, above the optic chiasm. Okay, right. So we have the suprachiasmatic nuclei now, but what I want to do is go further. I want to now do this cross-section at number two, and don't worry, we're not going through every single cross-section of the hypothalamus. I just want to make sure that we now uh, know where the anterior hypothalamic nuclei are and where the paraventricular nuclei are. Okay, so if you like, we're now moving back to the next cross section, okay? So if you move on, you know, for, for this cross section will stay the same for a certain amount of thickness, okay? So let's say all of this portion here is like this, okay? We now want to go to the next portion that is different, okay? And that's where we're now taking this next cross section from, okay? Where we'll see different nuclei, basically. Okay, so we're taking cross-section number two now, uh, which is this next step back where the nuclei that we're now going to see are all going to have changed. The third ventricle has opened up a bit, so it will now be wider, things like that. Okay, so let's now take the second cross-section. So now we are further back, so we're not going to have the optic chiasm and the anterior commissure above and below us. Okay. Uh, so let me now draw what we will see here. So here, once again, is this section of hypothalamus. And now, as I said, the third ventricle is going to be much wider here. Okay, so let me now draw the much wider third ventricle here. 
Okay, and it will then have the periventricular hypothalamus all the way around it, like so. Okay, so I'll colour this in in orange here. This is the periventricular portion of the hypothalamus. Okay, now, uh, firstly, I will put on the little portion right at the bottom here. Okay, we are not going to need this portion right at the bottom, but again, just for a complete picture, I'll put it there. Okay, this is a portion known as the median eminence of the uh, hypothalamus. Halima, sorry, hypothalamus. So this is the median eminence down here. Okay, and now what we can do is divide the rest of this up uh, into medial and natural. Okay, right, so here is the medial portion, so this is a medial portion, this is a medial portion, and these are the two lateral portions. Okay, now the lateral portion is going to make up one massive nucleus, uh, but the medial portion is going to be divided into two separate nuclei. Okay, right, so let me now show you the paraventricular hypothalamic nuclei, and these are going to be important, as we'll see later, in the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Okay, right, so in turquoise there, these are the paraventricular nuclei, the PVNs. Okay, and again you have a left paraventricular nucleus and also a right paraventricular nucleus. So this one's the left one, this one's the right one. Again, we're looking from the front. Okay, so PVN stands for paraventricular nucleus. Okay, and I'll underline this in turquoise. Then, underneath the paraventricular nucleus, and still very much so medial, okay, uh, this is the anterior hypothalamic nucleus, the other one that we're going to need, okay, and this is why I'm looking into this cross-section so that we can uh, see where the paraventricular nuclei are and where the anterior hypothalamic nuclei are. Okay, so this is what's often abbreviated down to the AHN, okay, so the A is for anterior, okay, the H is for hypothalamic, and then the N is for nucleus, okay, but again there are two of them, so it's really the anterior hypothalamic nuclei, there is a left anterior hypothalamic nucleus, and then there is a right anterior hypothalamic nucleus. Okay, right. Uh, and then finally, laterally, you have one massive great nucleus here, which we're not going to need, but again, I'll just put this on for completion of the anatomy. Okay, and uh, this massive great nucleus on the lateral hand side of the paraventricular nucleus and the anterior hypothalamic nucleus, uh, this is called uh, the lateral hypothalamic nucleus. Okay, so this is the lateral hypothalamic nucleus, which can be abbreviated down to the LHN. So lateral hypothalamic nucleus. And again, you have a left lateral hypothalamic nucleus and a right lateral hypothalamic nucleus. Okay, right. Uh, so that now is the anatomy done. Okay, uh, we now know what the hypothalamus is and we know where the suprachiasmatic nuclei are in the hypothalamus. They are positioned in this very ventral portion of the hypothalamus so that they are over the optic chiasm, basically. And you have two of them, the uh, left suprachiasmatic nucleus and the right suprachiasmatic nucleus. Okay, right, so we now want to talk about these things function. Okay, so they are often called the master clock. Okay, or the master clocks, if you like, because there are, after all, two of them. Okay, they uh, are a bunch of neurons. Okay, that's probably the first thing to start off with. In humans, there are around 20,000 neurons. So there's around 20,000 neuron cell bodies in each suprachiasmatic nucleus. Okay, so they're a bunch of neurons. Okay, and uh, they all have uh, their circadian oscillators oscillating in synchrony with one another. Okay, so all of the circadian clocks of these 20,000 neurons in these two suprachiasmatic nuclei are oscillating in synchrony with each other, and they are capable then of somehow synchronizing all the peripheral cells of the body with their circadian clocks. Moreover, they also um, 
are synchronized with the light dark cycles, okay? They are receiving information from the retina in ways that we will see in a moment about the uh, light dark cycles, and they synchronize their circadian clocks with uh, the light dark cycles, and then they are responsible for uh, sending signals out to all of the peripheral cells of the body and keeping uh, the circadian clocks of all of the peripheral cells of the body in tune with the light dark cycle. Okay, so that's why they are called the master clock. Okay, because they are the ones which are checking the information about the light dark cycles and then sending this information to all the other cells of the body and telling them uh, where their circadian clock should be at the moment. Okay, and keeping all of their circadian clocks in synchrony with the light dark cycles. Okay, right, so that's the big picture of what the suprachiasmatic nuclei are going to do and why they are considered uh, the master circadian clocks in mammals. Okay, right, so let's now ask how they can do this function. Okay, well the first thing I want to talk about is how do they all keep their circadian clocks in synchrony with one another? Okay, well, this is very poorly defined. We don't know why all of these neurons actually are uh, have the same circadian time as one another. Why are they all in synchrony? Okay, it's obvious that they have the potential to do that because they're all very close by one another. They're all connected to each other with synapses. Okay, so they're all communicating. So it's obvious that they have the ability to communicate to each other and therefore work as one unit effectively and have all of their circadian clocks uh, in tune with one another. But with regards to actual mechanisms, it's really poorly defined. We don't know is the answer. Okay, what we do know is that they're anatomically very close together, they're all connected together, they're all communicating with each other, so it's obviously feasible that they um, could uh, communicate uh, the state of their circadian clocks to other neurons in that site. Okay, so however they're doing it, they are doing it, basically. So all of these neurons are uh, in tune with one another. Their circadian clocks are at the same point, basically. All of their circadian clocks are in synchrony. Okay. What is better understood is how then uh, they are receiving information from the retina about the light dark cycles, okay, and how this can alter uh, the position of these neurons' uh, circadian clocks. Okay, so I now want to talk about the effect of the retina, um, well, how the retina communicates the light dark cycle state to the neurons in the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, right. Uh, so, basically, this doesn't involve the classical photoreceptors in the retina. Okay, so the classical photoreceptors in the retina are the rod cells and the cone cells. Okay, they are nothing to do with this, basically. Uh, it involves non-classical photoreceptors in the retina, okay, which are called photoreceptive ganglion cells. Okay, now ganglion cells are normally neurons in the retina. Okay, they're normally not photoreceptors. Okay, so the main photoreceptors in the retina are the rods and cones. Ganglion cells usually synapse onto bipolar neurons, which themselves synapse onto uh, the rods and cones. So basically, the ganglion cells are usually just uh, reciting the information from the rods and cones to the brain. They are just basically a rename neuron relaying the information from the rods and cones to uh, deeper portions of the brain, basically. They're not normally involved in the photoreception re themselves. However, a very small population of the ganglion cells are called photoreceptive ganglion cells. Okay, and these are the ones which are going to be really important in communicating information not to the portions of the brain which uh, then process conscious vision and all of that, okay, but instead to the suprachiasmatic nuclei which are then going to use this information about the light dark state uh, to uh, synchronize their circadian clocks with the light dark cycle. Okay, so let me draw a picture then of a photoreceptive ganglion cell. So basically, they, they look pretty much like typical neurons. Here are their dendrites coming off the cell body here. 
okay? And they will then have an axon that will be very long and will go into the optic nerves, basically. So this will be on the surface of the retina. Here's its axon. That will go into the optic nerve here. So this is cranial nerve 2, okay? And then we'll see how it can then uh, go to the suprachiasmatic nuclei via the retinohyperphenolic tract in a moment. Okay, so this is representing our photoreceptive ganglion cell. So how? How is the photoreceptive ganglion cell uh, actually capable of responding to light then? Okay, well, uh, it has within it a very special pigment, photosensitive pigment, okay, which I'm putting in in dots here, okay? So this photoreceptive pigment is a pigment called melanopsin. Okay, so this is melanopsin represented here. And basically, melanopsin can absorb light, okay? And when it does absorb light, what it can result in is depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the photoreceptive ganglion cells, cell membrane, okay? And this can then result in the ganglion cell being more likely to fire action potentials. So basically, the more light you expose a photoreceptive ganglion cell to, the more frequently it will fire action potentials, okay? So, now what we want to see then is where do photoreceptive ganglion cells deliver their information to? Well, the answer is only to the suprachiasmatic nuclei. These things are not involved in normal vision, okay? Vision that goes to the conscious areas of the brain. No, it's not involved in all of that, okay? That's the rod and cone cells, okay? It delivers its information about light-dark cycles uh, to the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, so let me now discuss then how uh, these neurons actually get to the suprachiasmatic nuclei. So let me draw a picture then of the two retinae here. So here is the right retina, okay, and this will represent the left retina here. Okay, so I'll just colour both of these in in turquoise. So this is representing the right eye, and this is representing the left eye here, okay? And then you'll have the optic nerves coming from these two eyes here, okay? And then we know that the optic nerves then, some of the neurons in them are going to cross over in the optic chiasm here, okay, to go into the contralateral optic tract. And we know now that the suprachiasmatic nuclei both the uh, left one and the right one here are sitting above the optic chiasm. Okay, so here are the suprachiasmatic nuclei of the hypothalamus. Okay, so that's just this picture here, basically. Here they are sitting above the optic chiasm. So you can probably appreciate how it's not too difficult for uh, neurons that are coming from these photoreceptive ganglion cells in the optic nerves to actually get to the suprachiasmatic nuclei. So basically they just jump up from the optic chiasm into the suprachiasmatic nuclei, okay? And this movement of a bunch of axons from the uh, optic chiasm to the uh, suprachiasmatic nuclei, this has a name, okay? This is called the retinohypothalamic tract, okay? So this connection from the retina to the hypothalamus is called the retinohypothalamic tract, okay? And for short, the retinohypothalamic tract is abbreviated to the RHT. Now, if you're hoping to be able to pick up a brain and find uh, a great big bundle of axons that is the retinohypothalamic tract that is visible to the human eye, then you're going to be awfully disappointed, okay? Basically, there aren't that many neurons actually going to the suprachiasmatic nuclei from the retina, okay? And they go generally at different points, basically, so they're not all running together, okay? So you don't end up with a visible structure that is the retinohypothalamic tract. Instead, the retinohypothalamic tract is really just the name for this um, this uh, bunch of neurons that are moving uh, from the retina to the suprachiasmatic nuclei in the hypothalamus, okay? Even though they're not all physically uh, alongside one another, so it doesn't make a physically uh, discernible structure. 
Okay, right. So basically, when it is light then, okay, so when uh, it's daytime, when there is high light levels, these photoreceptive ganglion cells are going to be firing action potentials at a higher frequency. So a higher frequency of action potentials is going to be delivered to these neurons within the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, so how is this going to reset the uh, circadian clocks within those neurons in the suprachiasmatic nuclei if they are out of sync with the light-dark cycle? Okay, well, before we can answer that question, we need to know what these uh, neurons are actually going to release onto the suprachiasmatic nuclei neurons uh, when they actually uh, release neurotransmitter. Okay, so in these synapses between uh, these photoreceptive ganglion cell axon terminals and the neurons of the suprachiasmatic nuclei, what are the neurotransmitters used? Well, the two main neurotransmitters that you find used are glutamate, okay, so one of the major excitatory neurotransmitters within the brain, and then another uh, molecule which you might never have heard of before, okay, called PACAP, okay, PACAP, which stands for pituitary adenylate cyclase activating protein, okay, so the first P is for pituitary, okay, the AC is then for adenylyl cyclase, Okay, so whenever you see AC in biology, it often does stand for adenyl cyclase. And then AP, the final AP, is for activating peptides. So pituitary adenyl cyclase activating peptide or protein um, is what PACAP or PACAP stands for. Okay, right. Um, so these... Uh, photoreceptive ganglion cells that are sending their axons into the suprachiasmatic nuclei then, these are the neurotransmitters that they are using, glutamate and PACAP, okay? Now, how is this going to help synchronize the suprachiasmatic nuclei uh, neuron circadian clocks with the light-dark cycles? Okay, well, basically, what these neurotransmitters do to the... Um, suprachiasmatic nuclei neurons is they activate intracellular pathways which we're not going to go through which lead to increases in period and cryptochrome proteins okay so the period proteins are going to go up and the cryptochrome proteins are going to go up now you will notice that that's exactly the opposite of what light did to um, the Drosophila cells. Okay, if you remember in the Drosophila cells, light activated that cryptochrome protein, which then de de destroyed period and timeless proteins. Okay, remember timeless is the equivalent of cryptochrome proteins in the mammal. Okay, uh, so this seems to be the exact opposite because now when light goes up, it's going to be activating these photoreceptive ganglion cells more. They're going to be releasing more glutamate and PACAP into the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And these two neurotransmitters are leading to period and cryptochrome levels going up in these suprachiasmatic nuclei neurons. Okay, uh, so why does that make sense? Well, you have to remember that the Drosophila circadian clock and the uh, mammalian circadian clock are not the same, okay? The levels of period and cryptochrome go up at different times in the uh, mammalian circadian clock compared to the times when period and timeless go up in the Drosophila circadian clock. Okay, so bringing back this picture, which shows us how period and cryptochrome go up during the day, it now becomes more obvious. Okay, so if I now shine a very bright light into your eyes at 4 a.m., what will be happening is uh, the suprachiasmatic nuclei neurons will now be induced to upregulate period and cryptochrome. So you're going to get increases in period and cryptochrome, okay, uh, because the photoreceptive ganglion cells will detect the increase in light. They will now release more glutamate and PACAP onto the suprachiasmatic nuclei neurons, okay, and that will cause the suprachiasmatic nuclei neurons to increase uh, the amount of period and cryptochrome they have. Okay, so what will that now do?
that will move you forward, basically, or move the clock forward. Okay, so if your clock thinks that it's 4 a.m. in the morning, and yet there is very bright light, what that is effectively going to do is it's going to reset your clock so that your clock now thinks that it's later in the day. Your clock will now think maybe it's 8 a.m. or 12 o'clock or whatever. Okay, it moves it towards midday, basically. Okay, in contrast, if it's let's say, uh, late evening, okay, let's say 8 o'clock maybe, okay, and now, uh, well actually, sorry, let's say your circadian clock thinks it's 8 o'clock, your suprachiasmatic nuclei neurons think that it's 8 o'clock, okay, and yet there is very bright light, so let's say the real time is midday, okay, uh, then what will happen is you'll get bright light in your eyes, this will be activating your photoreceptive ganglion cells, okay, uh, they will then be releasing more glutamate and PACAP into the suprachiasmatic nuclei, okay, and that will be causing the period and cryptochrome levels to go up. So it will now move you backwards, basically, or move you back towards your circadian clock thinking that it's midday, basically, okay. So, this does make sense, basically. Uh, it's moving your circadian clock towards thinking it's midday, which is where light will be brightest, basically, okay? Uh, so, this does make sense as, to, as a way of synchronizing the suprachiasmatic nuclei circadian clocks uh, with the light-dark cycle. Okay, right. Uh, so we'll call it there for this video. In the next video, what we'll then turn our attention on to is what does the suprachiasmatic nuclei, uh, or rather what do the suprachiasmatic nuclei now actually do, okay? Uh, so we want to f see how they are responsible for synchronizing the circadian clocks of all the other cells of the body. We've now seen how they are synchronized with one another, or at least we've seen a potential explanation for how they might be synchronized with one another. It's obvious that they could be synchronized with one another, and indeed they are synchronized with one another, okay? Uh, and we've now seen how uh, the retina can send information to the suprachiasmatic nuclei to keep their circadian clocks in tune uh, with the light-dark cycles. What we want to now see is how do the suprachiasmatic nuclei, as the master clocks of the mammalian body, actually keep all of the circadian clocks of the peripheral cells in synchrony with one another, in synchrony with them, uh, and in synchrony, therefore, with the light-dark cycle.